일찍부터 함께해 주신 여러분 고맙습니다. Thank you very much for participating early this morning. I am h e s u Park, the moderator of today's event. It is a pleasure to meet you. We will now begin Step B, International Symposium 2020. Step B, International Symposium 2020, will be held under the title Innovate STI Policy, STI Responding to COVID-19 Era and Digital Transformation. It is being organized by STEPI and is being sponsored by the Ministry of Science and ICT to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Uh, we are holding this conference with uh, only a handful of speakers and VIPs gathered offline, and it is being broadcast uh, online. And uh, I would like to thank once again the uh, guests who are participating via online and offline. And uh, we will now be hearing the opening remarks of the president of STEP-P. Please give him a big hand. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I am Zhu Huanghui, the president of STEPI. First of all, I would like to extend my gratitude to all of you for joining us here today despite your busy schedules. I would also like to extend my gratitude to Mr. Chung Pyong Sun, the first vice minister of science ICT ROK, Professor Dunder Ko Kaolu of uh, PICMET, as well as all the speakers from home and abroad for joining us at this symposium today. Due to COVID-19, our society is going through various changes. Uh, unlike the previous years, we are holding the STEPI International Symposium online and uh, we cannot meet you face to face. That is one of the examples of the changes that we're experiencing in our daily life. Currently, we are faced with myriad challenges across uh, various domains. Uh, we have to adapt to these changes uh, in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic and across the economy and society, we have to build a flexible, resilient and sustainable system. In this context, science, technology and innovation are becoming increasingly more important. STEPI is a global think tank responsible for policy research into science, technology and innovation. We carry out socioeconomic analysis in the wake of COVID-19 and also we project changes in the international order by publishing future outlooks. We also have a mid to long term strategies at the national level in order to respond to the pandemic. Also, we have a series of forums for post COVID-19 era and also we uh, do policy research into science and technology policies to proactively respond to the pandemic. Pandemic, and also we propose the future direction for global science and technology cooperation, as well as to build a smart city for uh, the public. I would like to take this opportunity to wish for a successful discussion in terms of how the different countries are using innovation to respond to COVID-19, and also so that we can have constructive discussions about the future direction of science, technology and innovation policies in the era of new normal. STEPI will continue to do its best to uh, develop science and technology at the national level and also have uh, cooperation from uh, home and abroad in order to lead innovation. I would like to once again thank you all for being with us here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. We had the opening speech from President of STEPI. We have to adapt to the changes in the wake of COVID-19 and also we have to uh, emphasize the importance of science and technology and innovation in order to respond to the challenge of the pandemic, which makes the symposium more meaningful. Next, we will be hearing from the first vice minister of the Ministry of Science and ICT, Mr. Byung Sun Jung. Uh, due to COVID-19, we will be receiving his message via recorded video. Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to meet you. I am the first Vice Minister of Science and ICT, Pyong Sun Chong, and I would like to congratulate the holding of the International Symposium 2020 under the title Innovate STI Policy, and I would like to thank the President of STEP-B, Hwang Hee Jo, and other staff for participating 
for preparing today's symposium. And despite the difficult situations, I would like to uh, thank uh, the experts from home and abroad and participants uh, for participating in today's event. Due to uh, the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, globally, countries are faced at a historic turning point under such circumstances. We must ask fundamental questions about our society and future generation. And in this sense, I think that today's topic and title of the International Symposium, which is Innovate STI Policy, STI Responding to COVID-19 Era and Digital Transformation, is very meaningful and timely. Due to COVID-19, the world is undergoing accelerated change. Amid such seismic change, we need to take on a proactive attitude to uh, seize this as an opportunity rather than considering this just as a crisis, and it will become an opportunity for us to enhance our national competitiveness. For the past 50 years, science and technology le played a leading role in de de the development of economy and society in Korea. In responding to COVID-19, we utilized our technology to develop a diagnosis kit uh, very quickly, and this set an example uh, in our quarantine system. In addition, we are working hard to develop treatments and vaccines. Uh, we are also preparing a new uh, era after the coronavirus era, and uh, we will prepare for a digital New Deal and a Green New Deal. In addition, we will innovate technology by integrating technology and innovation-oriented values uh, with uh, human-centered values. And uh, due to the these global issues, we need international cooperation. Through this forum, we hope to identify what new opportunities and challenges are out there. And I would like to thank all of the participants for taking time out of their busy schedules. And once again, I would like to thank the organizers for preparing today's forum. And I hope that we can discuss many ideas and also gain insights. And I hope that this leads to better policies. I would like to extend my best wishes to all of you. Thank you very much. We heard from the first Vice Minister, Pyong Sun Chong. Uh, today, we will talk about how to use STI policy to improve national competitiveness and also pull together wisdom uh, in the face of the global pandemic. Next, we will have a congratulatory speech from President Dundar Kokalglu of PICMET. Professor Kokalglu sent his message from Portland, U.S. We'll meet him via video. President Huang Yicho and Vice Minister Ning Son Jong of the Ministry of Science and uh, ICT. It's my pleasure to congratulate Steffi for organizing such an incredible symposium at such a critical time on such a, a, uh, an important topic. We are going through a pandemic that is uh, not similar to anything we've seen before, but worse. The health problem comparable to what we are seeing today around the world was more than 100 years ago in 1918, the previous one. So for the more than 100 years, the world has not experienced a crisis like this. We're learning. We're learning to do things differently, to think differently, to act differently. And when we have a critical problem like that, we're looking for solutions. And we see that the major part of the solution lies with science, technology, and innovation. Technology by itself cannot solve all the problems in the world. But there are very few problems that can be solved without serious involvement of technology. 
I congratulate Steppy on behalf of PICMET, Portland International Center for Management of Engineering and Technology, to take on this role, take the leadership, and have this incredible symposium on Innovate STI policy, STI responding to COVID-19 era and digital transformation. I would also like to thank Steppy for hosting and being the primary sponsor of our forthcoming conference, PICMET 19, that will be held in De John City on August 8th through 12th, 2021. It's going to be built on the same topic. It's going to expand the topic. There will be about 300 or so papers from around the world. Those who manage technology or develop technology policies, science, technology, innovation policies, do this by combining technological system, political system, social system, economic system, environmental system, legal system, and ethical system. Well, co considering them simultaneously, because the issues are very complex. And looking at the outline of this symposium, I see that Steppy has done that. Once again, I congratulate Steppy, and I welcome all of the participants on behalf of PICMET, and wish you a successful symposium. 네, 이렇게 영상으로나마 축하 메시지를 보내 주신 President Kokoglu as well as the first vice minister Jung Byung-sun for sending a video messages to congratulate us. Now we will begin the presentations for today. The theme for today is Innovate STI Policy, STI in response to COVID-19 era and digital transformation. We will have our first presentation by Dr. Alessandra Kolekia, Head of Science and Technology Policy Division, OECD Directorate for Science, Technology and Innovation. international experts. I'm sorry not to be there with you this morning, but I'm really pleased to be able to address this very timely international symposium organized by STEPI with a recorded intervention. So, as we all know, we're living in unprecedented times, and the COVID-19 pandemic has generated the worst health, economic, and social crisis of our lifetime. And science, technology, and innovation are the only way out across the across the world, the universities, public research institutes, pharmaceutical and bio firms have rapidly engaged in R&D to develop new treatments and vaccines for COVID-19, often in collaboration across organizations and borders, and often employing artificial intelligence to learn more about the virus and speed up the development of the vaccines. Meanwhile, much of the world went online, accelerating a digital transformation that has been underway for decades. E-learning, teleworking, e-commerce, e-health have become the new normal. And firms across the world have adopted digital business models to maintain operations and preserve some revenue flows, while mobile applications were developed to help track and trace the spread of the virus. Today, I would like to share with you some of the key findings and messages of our forthcoming science, technology, and innovation outlook. The, the report has a subtitle that you can see up on the screen, Times of Crisis and Opportunity. And I would like to stress the word opportunity. So our science, technology, and innovation outlook has three main storylines. The first, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a period of unprecedented and rapid mobilization of the STI community. We have seen an outpour of ideas and policy experimentation. Second, the pandemic has underscored the fundamental importance of science and technology as an essential element of both having a resiliency to address external shocks and generate a response. Third, 
uh, our system has been under stress. So this has exposed gaps and weak spots. And we really think there is an opportunity to reset STI policies and direct science and innovations towards more sustainable and inclusive futures. Uh, let me go through these uh, different stories. So uh, our uh, um, research has estimated that in the first few months of the pandemic, national research funding bodies worldwide spent around 5 billion US dollars uh, on emergency funding for COVID-19 R&D. You can see the figure up there. At least uh, 550 million uh, US dollars was allocated by philanthropic foundations, the green part, uh, to COVID-19 research during this period, on top of their pledges to major international cooperative initiatives, the gray part. In the second half of the 2020, the red dash line, national research funders have increasingly integrated calls for COVID-19 R&D into traditional mainstream funding mechanisms which makes their identification and measurement more difficult. Are these investments being made uh, uh, at the expense of funding for other disciplines? And if so, of what scale? The uh, jury is still out for that. The flip side to widespread engagement of the research community in designing solutions to COVID-19 is the risk of diverting research efforts indiscriminately away from non-COVID-19 related topics. Now, it is still early to discern the impact, but the amount of scientific output generating in this first few months of the pandemic is staggering. Around 70,000 scientific publications on COVID-19 were published between January and October 2020. And the United States accounts for the largest share, um, followed by China, the UK, and Italy. Uh, we have seen an acceleration of slow-moving trends. Research databases and scientific publishers have removed paywalls so that the scientific community could click, quickly share COVID-19-related data and publications. Preprints, that is, academic papers that have not been peer-reviewed or published yet, have become more common in the medical research field, allowing for faster diffusion of scientific findings, but also raising risks around research quality. Um, you would notice uh, that uh, in the case of COVID-19 related uh, publication, 76% of those are open access. And you can compare that figure with the uh, figure related to dementia, only 40% are open access publication or diabetes, 43%. These developments mark important changes and could accelerate the transition to more open science in the long run. We have also seen the impact on how science is conducted. We have run a survey, the Science Flash Survey, and three quarters of scientists who responded to this survey indicated they had shifted to working from home. Many scientists 40% of the cases, and especially women, experience a reduction in their time for research as a consequence of the pandemic crisis. As we have seen in many walks of life, in the work, schools, and shopping, the pandemic has accelerated the digital transformation that was already underway. Again, our surveys tell us that around two-thirds of scientists have experienced or expect an increase in the use of digital tools for research. Similarly, the private sector has delivered a wide range of innovative solutions to help cope with the health emergency and emerge from it as robustly as possible. Many firms have developed uh, uh, responding the use of digital technologies to maintain operations, and the biopharmaceutical industry, often in partnership with academia, has launched hundreds of clinical trials targeting COVID-19 drugs and vaccines. Here, your figure you see is uh, about vaccines. Academic startup companies have also played a significant role in these efforts. So, um, clearly, the COVID-19 crisis has disrupted the normal functioning of innovation systems. Uh, 
As you know, and you've seen historically on an aggregate basis, business investment in research and innovation are pro cycle So when the cycle goes down, so do investments in R&D and innovation. And they tend to contract in times of crisis. This crisis, though, might be different. Um, it's too early to tell. But we have put together some data uh, using uh, company balance sheets. And we are seeing that uh, some of the um, companies that are actually R&D intensive are doing pretty well in terms of uh, revenues, but also in terms of spending in R&D. So the issue is, could COVID-19 be an accelerator of R&D and innovation, or could the crisis exacerbate the gaps in business research and innovation activities between leading and lagger sectors, large and smaller firms, and geographical areas? So having explored the impacts uh, of uh, the COVID-19 crisis on the STI system very briefly, um, we are get to the point of the third story. So, what about the future? Uh, and we have seen that you know SDI has been at the center to the respond to the crisis uh, uh, with digital technologies and mobilization. Uh, but what about SDI uh, being able to do even more for an anti-societal and economic resilience? Um, there are challenges out there. This is not the first one. And the last one, there is a climate, for example, emergency. Uh, and so there is an opportunity to embrace a sustainability agenda. Um, so this is what uh, uh, we are faced with now, whether the COVID-19 is really a disruptive moment uh, that we can use to address more aggressively societal challenges using STI policy, or whether we will go back to business as usual once this crisis has passed. Um, so many governments view the pandemic as a stark reminder of the need of to transition to more sustainable and equitable and resilient society. And then I think also the Korean uh, government has taken a, a very um, a visionary and bold initiatives uh, to go towards these more sustainable futures. Um, so many countries' recovery packages uh, include uh, uh, expenditures for R&D, uh, and so uh, science and innovation will be essential to promote and deliver such transitions. Um, but since the pandemic has exposed limits in research and innovation systems, we really need to address these gaps. Uh, otherwise, this um, uh, will prevent the realization uh, of uh, these sustainable futures. There is a need, we think, uh, to reset STI policies to better equip governments with the instruments and capabilities to direct innovation efforts towards the goal of sustainability, inclusivity, and resiliency. Um, across the OECD, Many recovery packages include R&D expenditures, as we said. Um, many of these are emphasizing the sustainability, resilience, and inclusive, inclusivity as central themes. Uh, and this calls for direct support. But at the same time, uh, the R&D support policy mix has shifted towards greater resilience on tax compared to direct support. You can see it here in this slide from the year 2000, how the blue line, uh, the upward blue line, which is the, the one on indirect uh, support to R&D through tax incentives, uh, and how this is in contrast with the um, dark blue line, which has been going down, uh, since the uh, global financial crisis of 28-29, and that's the direct support to R&D. Uh, so there is this, uh, this gap. Our S policy mix is really um, uh, skewed towards indirect tax incentives uh, uh, relative to direct ones. Why? Uh, well, designed direct measures for R&D are certainly better suited to support longer-term high-risk research and target innovation that other generate public goods 
like health in this case, or have a high potential for knowledge uh, spillovers. So now, governance indebtedness um, is much higher than what it was during the 2008-2009 uh, global financial crisis. And OECD projections show it's expected to rise sharply over the next year or so as governments step in to protect their economies. There are uncertainties regarding the future of research funding after the crisis then. On the one hand, the emerging economic crisis could trigger significant cuts in public research and innovation budgets, so reducing research and innovation capabilities for many years to come. Uh, we're not seeing signs of that as yet, but uh, the past global financial crisis of 2008 and 2009 uh, just uh, points to in this direction. On the other hand, the pandemic may underline the importance of science and innovation for being both prepared and reactive to upcoming crises, which could translate to stronger support for research and innovation in the longer term. We simply do not know yet. Um, we are at a turning point. Now, the crisis has underscored the importance of the need for transdisciplinary approaches so as to tackle complex weak, weak problems like the pandemics. But the research system is still ill-adapted to this need. So disciplinary and hierarchical structures need to be adjusted to enable and promote transdisciplinary research that engages different disciplines and sectors. Um, and just when we need STEM skills professionals more than ever, we're actually seeing, and we're analyzing that in the SDI outlook, uh, we're seeing an increase in precarity of early career professionals, many of whom are employed on short-term contracts with no clear perspective of a permanent academic position. And the pandemic is expected to make matters worse. Those are the results, again, of the OECD Science Flash survey. New incentives and measures for evaluating both individuals and collective contributions to science need to be put in place uh, to support these alternative career options, including channeling this expertise to other sectors. Now, this figure instead um, tells you that the global pandemic really necessitates a global response. Here we map country of origins of the research on COVID-19 and shows the United States and the China hub and all the links uh, across countries. So, so our uh, main message here is uh, the science depends on global knowledge commons. And uh, to maintain this, governments really need to build trust and define commons and shared values to ensure a level playing field for scientific cooperation and an equitable distribution of benefits. Um, so we can see that uh, much of the international collaboration uh, is actually driven by uh, scientists themselves. So it is bottom up. Uh, but uh, for challenges like COVID-19, there is also a need for top-down coordination, as no single country can beat the pandemic on its own, and this will not be the last of the global challenges. We need to recognize uh, that the speed with which research groups and biopharmaceutical firms are developing the vaccines builds on first years of basic research investment, Second, on recent institutionalization of international coordination efforts, particularly the establishment of the CEPI in 2017, to develop agile technology platforms that can be activated as new pathogens emerge. Here the figure shows the partners in the ACT Accelerator, which is a global collaboration to accelerate development, production, and equitable access to COVID-19 tests, treatment, and vaccines. So uh, these relatively new arrangements are performing well and should be scaled up and extended to other global challenges where R&D preparedness for crisis is important, capitalizing on the momentum for the response to COVID-19. 
to conclude, we see a lot of uncertainties uh, so that will shape the impacts that the crisis is having on the STI system and also we shape the contribution that the STI system can make to solving society global challenges. So um, the course of uncertainty is shaped by choices in most cases, governments can choose the direction to take to avoid some obviously bad options and pursue more promising ones. Um, so the, we are really at the turning point, and it's really up to governments uh, to decide which way to go. Um, then governments to do this need to possess those dynamic capabilities to be able to adapt and learn in the face of rapidly changing conditions. So I really hope that the um, uh, symposium today and the discussion will help share experiences on how to do that, how to go beyond the COVID-19 crisis and make our society a better future. Uh, thank you so much for you, your attention and uh, have a great uh, debate and discussion. Uh, thank you. 네, 고맙습니다. Thank, thank you very much, much Dr. Alessandra Kolekia, for your presentation. Uh, Head of Science and Technology Policy Division, OECD Direct for STI. Thank you very much. She emphasized on the innovation of STI policies across OECDs in the wake of COVID-19, as well as our future challenges. Next, I would like to introduce our next speaker. We will be hearing on the forthcoming shape of the U.S. innovation portfolio and possible impact of responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. And the presentation will be provided by Dr. Mel Horwich, a former university professor of CEU. Can you hear me? I can, indeed. Okay, thank you. Uh, please start the presentation. Okay, please start the presentation. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, Dr. Hovich, are you ready? Okay. I am. Okay. Good morning, everybody, and uh, greetings from cold northern New England and Maine. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. Hopefully, we'll make that up when I come to the PICMET conference next August, and I'm looking forward to that very much. And thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, congratulations on this exciting event, this exciting symposium. Uh, during the next few minutes, what I would like to do is share with you some thoughts I have on the emerging shape, particularly of U.S. innovation, but also innovation around the world, and the possible impact of our responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. And indeed, like the previous speaker, my message is actually one of optimism. I think after this crisis is over, after we've uh, absorbed the learning, after we've dealt with the challenge, uh, to deal with new challenges that society faces in the 21st century. And so I'll share with you some of my thoughts based on my own experience uh, my past research and my current research and innovation and my dealings with uh, um, the first thing I would like to say is that I believe that innovation is a very complex topic. 
it's dynamic. It's gone through many different eras and stages and attributes since, since the World War II has ended up to the current phase. We had innovation in government. We had innovation with big projects in the 50s and 60s, particularly in defense and infrastructure. Of course, we had the rise of R&D and global R&D and technology strategy and corporations. And in the United States in particular, and then around the world, we had the rise of high-tech entrepreneurialism with the rise of the Internet, Silicon Valley, and so on. And now we are... We have entered a phase, I think, where we are getting dynamic blends of all these different kinds of innovation on both a local and global basis to deal with issues that we face today, where no one type of innovation can do it all. We need collaboration. We need cooperation. We need what I call creative tensions in order to deal with the problems that we face, including the pandemic. And even in my own experience, we've seen these waves, sometimes successful, transform societies. I worked for six years in France, uh, starting a new high-tech business school as an academic dean. And I saw how even in France, we had the TGV, we had nuclear energy, very successful. And where I was in Sophia Antipolis, the French decided as a major project to create their own Silicon Valley, which was successful up to a point. Of course, it wasn't not everything that the French did was successful in big ideas. Minitel, a sort of a dumb terminal idea, was eclipsed by the Internet and it didn't succeed. But in France, we see how innovation can transform societies. And then I worked in New York City for 14 years. I came back from France, and I was there, and really part of the rise of New York City being reinvented, not just the corporate headquarters, not just the center of finance or a cultural center, but New York became a hub of high-tech entrepreneurialism, and indeed it was reinvented, particularly under Mayor Bloomberg. And I was part of that. We set up an institute in what was called Silicon Alley in lower Manhattan. And we also saw the rebirth of Brooklyn at the same time. And so we saw how innovation can transform cities, make cities vibrant, important hubs of creativity, creating entirely new industries and energizing energizing cities, even cities that were global, so that they, be, they became even more vibrant than we were before. I believe that this will continue and be extremely important in the future. Of course, innovation went through some very, very difficult times. Uh, you see on the screen a plane that was never built. Massive amounts of money went into the American supersonic transport, but in the end, the government never built it with the private sector, and it failed. It failed for economic reasons and environmental reasons and reasons that have to do with activism, activism to protect the environment. And it was really one of the first issues that we now see in an era of global change becoming more important, where as was said by uh, earlier today, technology is not enough. We also need ethical concerns, environmental concerns, and that we saw in the 60s with the SST. On the upper right, you see, you see what was once Bell Labs, perhaps the preeminent apparatus for innovation in R&D in the United States and the world, where all kinds of technologies were developed. But once AT&T AT &T was deregulated, once there was competition, once AT&T was broken up, Bell Labs lost its position of preeminence, of singular preeminence. And it lost it really to high-tech entrepreneurialism, to innovation, to companies like Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Instagram, Uber, and so on. So we had a transformation of innovation where some things declined and others emerged. 
My view, by the way, is even these great companies that we see today are not enough. They are insufficient to deal with the problems that we face. They are part of the solution, but they are not the whole, solu whole solution. And what we have emerging in the world today, even before the pandemic, even before the pandemic, is a rebirth, a rise of a new kind of macro innovation, a new kind of set of creative blends. I call it macro innovation. I call it macro innovation 2.0. Excuse the phone. So I call it macro innovation 2.0. And I'm going to give three examples of how we are already dealing with innovation in a new broad based way today, even before the pandemic hit us. The first is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence we all know about. Some people say it's what they call a general purpose technology, transformational, like electrification, uh, modern information technology, and, and so on. The steam engine. And different regions are creating their own strategies to deal with it. For example, in the United States, we have government reports looking at whether we should have a national strategy. Do we need more money? Does government need to be involved? Or do we leverage our own creativity and entrepreneurial nature? In the EU, where I spent six years working in Hungary, they have developed their own strategies and papers for AI, and they are concerned about being left behind, about being left behind. But they're all con also concerned about privacy and about the ethical consequences, the social consequences of AI. At the same time, in China, there's a different point of view where AI is seen as a, gen a general purpose technology and is a linchpin to capital catapult China into leadership in the 21st century technology world. AI is at the center. It's at the anchor. It is an anchor uh, for China to leapfrog and become a leader in the world in innovation and technology. And it is a more centralized approach, a more managed approach, an explicit approach uh, to, be, to use AI for the rise of China in innovation. And we are worried about it. We have reports dealing, questioning whether in fact this is a challenge for the United States. In my view, in my view, AI will become a competitive, collaborative ecosystem, battleground for innovation competition for the next number of decades. I worked, for, I worked for eight years in Hungary, running a business school. Hungary is a little country, 10 million people. It's in Central Eastern Europe. It was under communist rule until 1989-90. And even in Hungary, which is not a leader in innovation in terms of the rankings, even in Hungary, AI is considered important. There are government programs in that, and there are coalitions of government, industry, universities. This, in this case, the AI coalition in Hungary has approximately 150 members, the last I looked. So even in a country like Hungary, AI is seen as a transformational technology in order to leapfrog, leapfrog into the future. AI is also seen by people in Africa as a way to leapfrog, as a way to deal with health, transportation, uh, education, and food, and what's called smart, smart agriculture, agritech. 
and I've seen this when I visited Africa, when I visited Nigeria in particular. So again, we are seeing a new era of innovation emerge from the perspective of AI as a general purpose technology. But it's not just AI. As I said with New York, with regard to New York City before, cities are transformation and regions are becoming smarter. My friends at the Intelligent Community Forum every year since 2002 have chosen the top seven and then the most intelligent community of the year. And it's a global, it's a global activity. As you can see from the slide from Europe, Asia, Korea has, has had cities as intelligent communities in many, many years, and it's one number one for several years, as has your neighbor, Taiwan, as has Europe and in the States. So again, we're seeing how innovation, these creative blends of macro innovation are becoming important in smart cities. In Europe, where I spent a lot of time in Eindhoven in the Netherlands, we see the rise of brain ports, where Eindhoven is a hub for a smart region, region transforming itself to become a leader in high tech, in auto, high, high tech automotive design, food, life tech, and other areas. In particular, in particular, Eindhoven, not that many years ago, was the hometown, the headquarters town of a company called Philips. It was old industry. Philips left Eindhoven to go elsewhere to become part of the 21st century. The top building is the old Philips R&D headquarters, kind of like Bell Lab. It was abandoned by Philips. Today, that building houses all kinds of new small startups. It's a kind of incubator. I'll talk about that later. And Philips rediscovered Eindhoven, the new transformed Eindhoven, and came back with a new R&D center. You see that below the screen on the university campus. Campus. It's a remarkable story, a remarkable cycle to look at. In Africa, in Lagos, which has all kinds of problems, it is also a hub for innovation. It is in Lagos that we see the rise of the second largest film industry in the world called Nollywood. It started about 10, 15 years ago with handheld, maybe 20 years ago with handheld cameras on the street. It's now a huge cinema industry in Africa and throughout the world. We also see, we also see government supporting innovation incubators. It's not enough to leave it to the private sector. And so in the UK, we have the government supporting what it calls startup factories, managed activities to create more innovation and entrepreneurship. This is a matter of policy in the 21st century. Again, if we go back to Lagos, Nigeria for a moment, we see that there's an area in Lagos, it doesn't look like much when you look at it, but when you go in the buildings, you can see it. It's called Yaba or Yabakan Valley. And that is a Silicon Valley in Africa, in West Africa, where all kinds of startups are there. You see Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook has a, has a facility there. Google has a facility there. And it, it also has an AI hub, AI incubator, and so Lagos, Nigeria, which doesn't even have a metro, even though it has 25 million paper, uh, people, is a center of innovation and cinema. And this is an example of what can take place today. So already, even before the pandemic hit us, even before we were confronted with the crisis that we now have, already the world was changing in Europe, in the United States, in Asia, in Africa, and elsewhere, as we put together creative blends, new ways to deal with our problems, whether it's cities, AI, uh, innovation clusters, clean tech, sustainability, and so on. 
And now I would like to turn to the to the what I think is what I think the role of the COVID pandemic may be in shaping our innovation future. What we see, I believe, if you look at this chart, is, is a number of creative tensions, choices that are being made to deal with the pandemic. And it isn't either or, they are not mutually exclusive, but they are, I think, elements that we have to consider in developing a strategy for the pandemic. Some nations have taken short-term immediate steps. And we look at nations like New Zealand, for example, and Taiwan and others. That have, Others are more long-term and strategic. I think, and I'll come back to this in a moment, Operation Warp Speed in the United States is a medium-term strategic technological choice that the United States has made for a variety of reasons. Sometimes we apply existing technology to mitigate. Other times we look at advanced technology, maybe unproven technology. Again, the United States seems to be emphasizing a technological solution. Sometimes the technology used are bounded, they're limited. There's one single technology. Others, other times there's a diversity, a variety of technologies. Again, Operation Warp Speed seems to be funding a variety, a selection of technologies, a selection of different kinds of technologic solutions, and so on. Sometimes we integrate existing technologies. Sometimes we try to integrate existing new and advanced technology. We have decentralized approaches and more centralized approaches. And we try to activate the bottom up, middle up, versus a kind of a top down structure. In the United States, we are trying to leverage states. It's a more federalist solution. Whereas in other countries, maybe smaller countries or even larger ones, it's much more centralized. Sometimes we leverage a single sector. Sometimes we leverage all the sectors, public and private. Sometimes we emphasize operational, immediate concerns. Other times we are much more strategic in our orientation, more long-term. And I also want to emphasize the issue of risk. How do we allow for and accept risk? If we allow for risk and accept it, it could be costly or do I, we buy our way out, at least for financial risk? In the United States, we have identified risk and we bought it out. Sometimes we use conventional methods that we understand, and other times we are trying to use state-of-the-art professional management, project management methods. I think if we turn to the United States and we look, for example, at Operation Warp Speed, it is clear when you look at the diagrams that come out of this out of this activity, out of this attempt to deal with the pandemic, and I'm just showing them to you right now, they are clearly, it's clearly very complex. There's an acceptance of complexity in an attempt to manage it as a matter of management, as a matter of professionalism, as a matter of strategy, as a matter of organization. Operation Warp Speed is a massive attempt to deal with this problem over a, at least a medium term issue, not immediately, but an, and to accelerate it where we can accelerate it. So there's innovation, there's management, there's prior in making things very, very explicit. Another aspect of Operation Warp Speed that I want to emphasize here is that it includes both the government and private industry, it includes the civilian sector and the military sector. Indeed, the military sector is playing a key role in the supply chain, in creating the supply chain, a major role. And finally, we are dealing with, we are dealing with risk. We are dealing with risk by buying our way out of risk, by guaranteeing markets, by guaranteeing the need for production by paying for the production for some. And if it doesn't work, we will just put that, those products in the ground and carry them. 
So we are learning and we are developing a supply chain. We're developing new packaging. We are dealing with this in an explicit, managed, professional way. And those of us who teach technology management, project management, strategic management, operations management, understand this very well. It will be a good case study. And so I'd like to conclude by saying what I think all this means, what I think all this means. And I think what it means is we are learning how to accumulate knowledge. Out of this pandemic, I hope we will learn, we will learn what works and what doesn't work, and we will keep it in our inventory, in our knowledge inventory. We are learning how to apply professional management and advanced management practices, including AI. We are comfortable with risks. We are comfortable operating with uncertainty. We are comfortable with leveraging entrepreneurialism. We are comfortable applying short-term and long-term solutions. We are comfortable with the inclusion of variety. And I think this will give us confidence for the future as we integrate and apply all these methods to deal with the pandemic. As we leverage what we're learning about smart cities, AI, sustainability, and innovation clusters as well. This will give us confidence to deal with other issues, health issues, environmental issues, all kinds of issues in the future. So I am optimistic that out of this, we will be a better place in the future and innovation and technology management will play a key role. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you at this impressive conference. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. 자, 발표해 주신 닥터 멜 호위치. Thank you very much, Dr. Mel Horwich, former Dean of CEU Business School. In this war against COVID-19, uh, he introduced the US innovation portfolio. We have the third uh, presentation on competitive and resilient production through digitization, Industry 4.0 and Gaia X. The presenter is Mr. Karsten Eckhart, Head of Digital Manufacturing at TUV Rhineland Consulting. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Karsten Eckhart. I'm Head of Digital Manufacturing uh, at TUV Rhineland Consulting in Cologne, Germany, and I will talk today about competitive and resilient production through digitalization and this in context industry 4.0 and GAIA-X. So in the beginning, I want to introduce you with industry 4.0 and how this was coming up in the uh, early 2010 years. Uh, industry 4.0 was a strategy, strategy project of the German government in that uh, in its uh, high-tech strategy 2020 and it was launched and mentioned the first time by business economists in 2011 at the Hannover Fair in Germany. So from this, this was the start and this was uh, working on implementation recommendations. They was published first time in 2012. And uh, in this expert group of um, business economists, uh, they continue working on it. And the final report of the implementation recommendations for Industry 4.0 was published uh, at the Hanover Fair in 2013. The concern of Industry 4.0, uh, or of the German government for Industry 4.0, was uh, taking up the rapid social and technology development in this industrial area and to define some structures uh, for cooperation of all stakeholders and actors. And last but not least, to secure production capacities in a high wage country like Germany and also in Europe. Okay. So next, uh, it's a little bit an overview and uh, about the stakeholders of Industry 4.0, and we call it in a triangle of digital transformation. Let's start from the uh, from the top. Um, 
On the top is the uh, platform Industry 4.0. This platform Industry 4.0 was uh, founded by three industry associations, if you can see in the middle on the top. It's uh, VDMA, it's the uh, uh, association, association of um, machine manufacturers. And in the middle, ZVIE um, is the uh, association of electrical industry. And the last in this, uh, of these three is Bitcom. It's an uh, association of IT and communication brought in the uh, uh, now we call it just the Association of Digitalization in Germany. This uh, three uh, associations was uh, working on uh, the uh, development of uh, Platform Industry 4.0 and they established uh, it with uh, different working groups. They are working, or in these working groups are working expert communities from industry and research on different aspects of Industry 4.0, such as uh, communication or security, or also new business models. And uh, in 2016, uh, these three associations hand over the leading of uh, Platform Industry 4.0 to the two federal ministries, uh, German ministries, First, uh, the Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy, and uh, on the right-hand side, the Federal Ministry of Education and Research. Since this time, uh, the platform industry 4.0 is led by the German government. So in this industry for the uh, platform industry 4.0, there are they are working on a conceptual and strategy level, and they are also um, working on international cooperation strategies and on the integration of small and uh, mid-sized enterprises. On the right-hand side, you can see from this in platform industry for the go coming the input for the uh, level low for the lower level it's uh, on this slide which is uh, the standardization council of industry 4.0 and on the right hand side the lnei 4.0 it's a labs network industry 4.0 the standardization council industry 4.0 is responsible for uh, the specification and uh, standard standardization of the recommendations uh, coming out from the platform industry 4.0. So as you can see, it's in initiation of cross-sectoral standards, coordination of uh, national and international standards, and cooperation with international um, fora and consortia. On the right-hand side is this uh, LAPS network, Industry 4.0. This is uh, responsible for the validation of the uh, recommendations coming out from the uh, platform Industry 4.0. And they do it in pilot projects and proof of concept. And uh, yeah, and the validated uh, returns of, of results going back to the Standardization Council and also the Standardization Council will give the guidelines of relevant standards to the lab network industry for that hope. In the middle, to the left and the right hand side uh, of the, the platform industry for that hope, you can uh, get an insight of the international uh, collaboration of this platform. So on the left hand side, you can see the European countries uh, we are collaborating. It's France, Italy, Netherlands, Austria, Switzerland, Poland, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, and Spain, and UK. And on the right hand side, you can see there are so also on an uh, outside European. Um, collaboration with the IIC of uh, US, with the Chinese uh, um, 
and uh, Japan, indeed also uh, South Korea and India. So, Industry 4.0, what is it really? I have divided in two sides, like the left-hand side in this box. It's what you can see, it's what we have already today. Uh, and this is uh, in terms of uh, intercompany. We have cloud, we have networks, we have uh, factory automation with internet access, and we also have we deliver and we are using internet-based services. So what is new in Industry 4.0? And this is, you can see in the uh, box on the left-hand side, it's the value creation from cross-manufacturing exchange of information. Uh, we are going from com intercompany intranet to uh, Internet, the collaboration between companies uh, uh, via internet. And the next, uh, this is a really important uh, point on the, uh, the third uh, point is uh, manufacturer independent and industry neutral standards of communication services and semantics. It's a really a key factor for the success of what we see next. Industry 4.0 and um, Gaia X. So from that, if we realize, uh, if we get the uh, three points on the left hand side realized, uh, then we see multitude of new applications and business mo models where we emerge in the next time. As I mentioned before. Industry 4.0 was launched in 2011. So there was a review in last year, in 2019. And there's a new uh, vision, they call it Vision 2030 for Industry 4.0. And the underlining uh, headline is uh, Shaping Digital Ecosystems Globally. So, what is uh, necessary for this digital ecosystems. Um, there are three uh, aspects we see here on the left-hand side, interoperability. The cooperation and open ecosystems permit plurality and flexibility. Interoperability is really a key aspect for this digital ecosystems as uh, European wide, but also globally. And there are uh, three uh, three points they are, uh, they are important for that. It's regularity framework we need. We need standards in integration and we need decentralized systems and artificial intelligence. The next uh, aspect uh, in this uh, vision is uh, on the right hand side, uh, on the top, uh, sovereignty. So scope of actions inhibits competitiveness and control of personal data in digital business models. The key facts are uh, key um, in this is uh, technology development, we need security and we need the right digital infrastructure for that. The last uh, aspect is sustainability. Industrial value creation ensures a high standard of living. So it's the key facts of decent work and education and very raising point is uh, climate change mitigation and the circular economy. economy. Uh, social participation is also a key factor of that. Okay, if we see 
or if we are coming from Industry 4.0, what was the more initiative in in uh, in Germany, but with uh, international um, cooperation? And uh, as we can, as we have seen before, is uh, the vision for Industry 4.0 is digital ecosystems globally. So let's start with Europe. And uh, this is, I guess, the, uh, one of the points why Gaia X was uh, coming up. And uh, as you can see here, there's, Gaia X is motivated by uh, several challenges uh, to the digital, uh, European digital economy. What we can see on the left hand side, we have decentralized processing of locations. Or processing locations. No. Um, we have a lack of transparency and sovereignty over stored and processed data and infrastructure. This is a really um, main point of that. We have sector specific data and a lack of ontology. Um, yes, we have in different uh, industry domains, we have uh, specific uh, data spaces. And we have uh, different ontologies for these data spaces. So if we want to connect them together, we need uh, to overcome this uh, sector-specific um, uh, yeah, sector specific, um, specifications. And, uh, on the right hand side, uh, we, we see here that we have uh, multiple technology stacks uh, for in this area. We have an insufficient uh, clarity about the applicable jurisdiction. What we don't see is the uh, uh, is a widely accessible uh, API application programming interface. What makes difficult uh, for the interaction and the, uh, to access data spaces. And we have a multiple stakeholders and difficult uh, accessibility of existing data and infrastructure services. And all this uh, should be a, a Gaia X should be a, a given answer to all this challenges and threats. Let's see in the middle, it's the uh, overall uh, picture for, of, uh, of Gaia X. Uh, as you can see, it's three parts. Let's start from the uh, bottom. Uh, the red part is a uh, sovereign, sovereign uh, infrastructure, what we need. Uh, in the middle, it's European policies and a code of conduct. And in the uh, other part, it's the sovereignty, sovereign uh, data exchange. So we start with the creation of digital infrastructures and ecosystems for innovations, trusted environments between partners and interoperable links between smart services applications and infrastructure services. This will increase transparency and att attractiveness uh, of digital services. The reduce of barriers and compliant service usage enables the development of new services and products. Data sovereignty, strength of digital sovereignty of business, science and government and society. And last but not least, the reduction of dependencies, the reduce of private and business consumer dependency of single providers, uh, control over locations and regularity, environment of data, stored data. And as I mentioned before, reduce sector specific dependencies. Now we come more in a, a more detailed. Um, picture of uh, Gaia X. And as you can see in this overview, Gaia X should be provided a user-friendly and homogeneous uh, ecosystem 
for services and data. And let's start again from the, uh, from the bottom. Uh, the infrastructure ecosystems, and you see the different uh, parts of, of the uh, infrastructure ecosystems like network and interconnection providers. Uh, second, the uh, uh, CSPs, what is uh, cloud service providers, or HPC in the middle, it's high performance computing. And we uh, have, as mentioned before, sector specific clouds. And last but not least, uh, edge devices where also data can be stored. At this level, uh, we see uh, uh, on the right hand side uh, which aspects has to be uh, uh, defined. Uh, this is a technical architecture. We need uh, architecture of standards and we need commercial policies. And we need also for compliance, uh, legal, regulatory, and policies. In the middle, uh, there are the uh, Gaia X Federation Services. In this uh, Federation Services, uh, there are four uh, blocks or pillars uh, like identity and trust, sovereignty data exchange, federated catalog and compliance. This uh, should ensure uh, interoperability and uh, trust and sovereignty of services. In the other part, we can see on a level uh, the different data spaces from the uh, 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 different uh, sectors or domains like industrial, smart living, mobility, financial, public, health, and all have different uh, data spaces, different uh, uh, structures of data, uh, different semantics, and uh, this has to overcome uh, with Gaia X. And on top of that, uh, if we connect all these um, data spaces together, then we have a cross-domain or cross-sector innovation in advanced smart services. We can build new marketplaces and new applications such as AI, IoT analytics, our big data. As mentioned before, uh, at the moment, this uh, Gaia X uh, has eight domains and user perspectives uh, to create data spaces. And you can see here for each uh, domain, there are different uh, use cases. They are already defined in, in Gaia X. So uh, the number is already more than 40 we have defined. And uh, in some domains, there are more and some it's not so much. But in this, from this um, use cases, which are defined for Gaia X, should be uh, defined the requirements for the implementation of Gaia X, or implementing our first specification of Gaia X. I want to explain. Uh, Gaia X a little bit more in detail uh, on a use case, which is here collaborative condition monitoring. And this should demonstrate how a framework of collaboration can contribute to develop self determinate business models for this uh, use case. And uh, it's now in the uh, part uh, below in the uh, infrastructure, you see three different uh, data storages with uh, hosted by different uh, service providers. So, and this is uh, the physical storage. And uh, at this level, we have just the uh, infrastructure 
application and data portability, and uh, we need uh, interoperable interoperability. In the middle, uh, the Gaia X Federation services uh, solve the, the uh, points on the right hand side, like uh, out of authentication and authorization and data connector policies and attributes. Uh, it's uh, for uh, identity validation and access rights and also usage control and also responsible for semantic, semantic and uh, interoperability. On top, uh, we see it, the different companies, they are using different data spaces uh, and can access not only the company data space, also uh, data spaces from other companies can create uh, advanced uh, smart services from that, like collaboration uh, condition monitoring. So I can um, use um, data from a special machine in different locations. So, and I can uh, monitor the conditions and make some analytics and, uh, yeah, on that. So GaiaX is increasing added value and the content consistency of service behind the individual use case. If we take this all together and at the, uh, at the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic we are uh, facing at the moment, um, there are some consequences and there's a position paper uh, of the platform industry for the DOE published uh, earlier this year. And they identify 10 propositions for the future digital business models for industry for the DOE in a post-corona economy. And there are three new strategic priorities. What we're facing is a boost of digitalization and new digital business models. Second, we, we see a flexibility and agility becomes the basis for competitive, competitiveness. Uh, we need to uh, react flexibly on changes in our um, supply chain or on market demands. This is uh, mean by uh, point two. And the resilience of uh, the value network as a new business case. Yeah, it's like uh, we will see uh, what we see already. It's, uh, um, it's a platform economy to um, offer uh, production capacities as a service. Yes, and on the uh, middle, on the right hand side, we see new business models. We see a localization of manufacturing and demands adoption of product and process architectures. We see new ecosystems and marketplaces are emerging and uh, innovative revenue models are getting traction. On the right hand side, uh, it's also infecting or affecting new work and organization aspects. So competence requirements are changing radically and physical distancing of production or in production make remote services more increasing and more important. And flexibilization of work fosters. This means new forms of organization 
and learning are necessary. So this flexibilization we are facing like uh, that employees maybe can't come to work because of they have to stay in quarantine or they are getting a um, COVID-19 infection. So all this and uh, we see it might we need a new flexibility in organizing our work. And number 10, last but not least, is industry for the dough. We see as an enabler for sustainability. This all together uh, and uh, our um, Conclusion is that the vision pre-COVID-19 is also the vision what we can with what we can continue post or after COVID-19. It's uh, we are um, already address the right uh, aspects of digital ecosystems. Thank you for your attention. 네, 발표 잘 들으셨나요? 발표해 주신 to Mr. Karsten Eckhart, head of digital manufacturing at TV uh, Rhineland Consulting in Germany. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, thank you so much for being here with us at STEP International Symposium 2020. Now we have the fourth presentation. The fourth presentation will be on business impacts and government supports on firms upgrading and innovation under COVID-19 in Southeast Asia. The presentation will be provided by Professor Pat Tara Pong in Tara Kum Nerd. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, uh, thank you very much. It's my great pleasure to be uh, at the STEPI Symposium. I want to uh, give a presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, please start the presentation. Okay. okay. Uh, my presentation is about uh, business impacts and government support on firms upgrading and innovation under COVID-19 in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is like the rest of the world, it has been uh, heavily uh, affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. But the degree of uh, impact are quite different across country in Southeast Asia. You can see that the Philippines and Indonesia has much more infected case compared to the rest. And Singapore is uh, relatively uh, much lower and country like uh, Thailand, Vietnam, and Myanmar are not so much uh, uh, affected. The number of cases are much lower. From the economic point of view, uh, we can see the large uh, contraction of the economies. The growth in GDP is minus, is negative. And uh, overall, ASEAN, uh, which is we stand for uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, overall we have uh, in the long term like 7% uh, de uh, reduction of the growth I mean, in the ne in negative seven uh, minus seven point two, and uh, most of the country also heavily uh, affected by the crisis. If we look at the consumer confidence, it's sharply dropped because of the 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 pandemic. The demand is very much low and uh, has been very uh, much in, uh, affected uh, by the, the pandemic. If we look at the short term and uh, uh, if we look at the impact of uh, the economy, we can see that the impact is quite big. 
if we cannot uh, contain the pandemic, the impact will be much bigger and ha also have the impact on trade and uh, many country in Southeast Asia depend a lot on international trade. So uh, the economy is heavily uh, affected and also have a very strong impact on um, employment and wage income as well. How about the uh, impact on firms at the micro level? Most of the firm, especially small and medium enterprise suffer and suspend their operation. For remaining firm, two thirds of them are operating at half capacity or less and why one third are facing severe liquidity crisis. The sharp drops in demand and revenues were among the greatest concern and the main cause of cash flow or liquidity problems. So in response, most of the enterprise are aware of the benefit of innovation and technological upgrading associated with e-commerce, uh, financial technology or fintech or teleworking. They want to change the crisis into opportunity. They're aware of that. But in reality, very limited numbers of firms are ready to adopt the new technologies. So that is a big challenge. If we look from the policy perspective, we can see uh, that policy can be divided into uh, two time frames, the short term and longer term. Uh, longer term also include uh, what should happen uh, after COVID pandemic. So the uh, short term uh, policy, of course, is focusing on economic life lives, uh, short term recovery of firms, but longer term, uh, in order to change the crisis into opportunity, uh, um, uh, there are many initiatives on uh, human resource development uh, for the, the future uh, 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 scientists and engineers, uh, especially people who can work after the pandemic is over. And also there are policy on business strategy and uh, business plan development, and uh, also the policy to support innovation and upgrading and digitalization e-commerce and creating the new market as a result of the pandemic. And also the uh, uh, trying to embrace industry 4.0 related technology like blockchain, artificial intelligence, robotization and 3D printing. So this is overall policy framework uh, adopted in Southeast Asia. Uh, if we look at the general policy support, we can see that the current measure in Southeast Asia, mainly focusing on short-term stimulus, uh, not so much on long-term. All the country deploy grant and subsidy and why most offer soft loan and over half uh, initiate loan guarantees. Indirect financial support also very much uh, predominant, like a debt mor moratorium, tax relief package, or employee related policy instrument, and measures regarding uh, rent and utility fees. And also, uh, there are some long term measures aiming at helping firms adjust their skill capabilities and business models. Uh, uh, but this is uh, in rela in relatively shallow and uh, also, also lacking. So uh, most of the policy focus more on short term. Uh, among the, the long-term policy, capacity building and training program are the most common long-term measures. The second most common long-term measures is the development of existing market efficiency and promotion of new market access through promotion of digital solution, e-commerce platform, uh, virtual business matching and networking. So this is the overall policy instrument in Southeast Asia. We can see that where we have policy instrument in uh, uh, short term, uh, which uh, cover direct financial support in terms of loan or grants or credit guarantee and indirect financial support, which uh, cover tax incentive moratorium and most country adopt uh, uh, 
uh, indirect financial support. Uh, a few countries adopt uh, direct financial support in terms of grant and loan. And uh, also, of course, uh, another short-term uh, stimulus measure is in terms of providing uh, information and guidance to the business. Long-term uh, measure, which is uh, still lacking and shallow, uh, mostly, as I already explained, focusing on capacity building and uh, followed by market-related measures and also uh, trying to make uh, informal business becoming formal. So it's, this is one part of the, uh, the policy because in Southeast Asia, there are many uh, informal businesses. Uh, policy on innovation and technology upgrading. Well, we can, if we look at this kind of policy in particular, we can see that in lesser developing country in Southeast Asia, like Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, the Philippines and Vietnam, they don't have uh, explicit uh, initiated policy measures due to the lack of the government uh, cap capabilities in terms of finance and human resource in human capital. And Brunei, uh, the, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand, uh, to some extent, uh, these countries, they are richer countries. They utilize support measure to promote innovation and technological development in both uh, public and private sector. So uh, they are doing relatively, relatively better in terms of policy on innovation and technological upgrading. Uh, I want to provide some example of this policy. Brunei uh, provide a co-matching grant uh, to the business planning to move uh, business from offline to online or e-commerce. Indonesia is trying to create uh, demand for online product by subsidizing 25% discount for online goods. So this is kind of the demand creation or demand side policy. Uh, Malaysia uh, uh, have the uh, specific uh, organization responsible for digitalization. They call it the Malaysian Digital Economy uh, Corporation. Uh, and they act as a focal point to devise digital strategy and solution for SMEs. There are many uh, grant schemes that specifically target on digitalization, uh, technology transformation, and smart automation. Singapore is uh, similar to uh, Malaysia. Uh, yeah. They have a specific grant scheme. Uh, SME go digital program, for example, subsidizing up to 80% of pre-approved solution to enhance SME digital transformation. They have the digital resilient bonus scheme for to endorse firm to further digitalize their operation and work with digital platform solution providers. Uh, they have the, uh, the traineeship program uh, the bridging the gap between skill developed by education system and skill needed in the market. So Singapore is uh, is quite uh, uh, policy are quite well rounded and very much targeted on digitalization, uh, also training and capacity building. And Thailand is uh, uh, in relation in, in relation to other country are uh, a little bit lacking. Uh, they have some policy connecting uh, SME in agriculture to uh, a tech startup or training program from the tech startup. But this is uh, too general compared to uh, Malaysia and Singapore. So in conclusion, like in the rest of the world, the crisis hit hard in Southeast Asia and most firms realized the importance of innovation and technological upgrading in response to COVID-19. But not many have implemented real changes. The most common policy support are still short-term economic uh, lifeline and uh, recovery. Long-term policy measures for innovation and upgrading are still lacking. So except Singapore and Malaysia, most countries in Southeast Asia do not have concrete long-term policy measures on innovation and upgrading in response to the new normal under and after COVID-19 and only uh, sporadic incentive program rather than holistic measures, capacity building program rather than targeted innovation capability development and economy-wide program rather than industry uh, or sector-specific innovation measure are observed in most cases. 
to policy recommendation for uh, Southeast Asia, which I think can be uh, useful for other regions as well, is that we should uh, focus more on long-term innovation policy for post-COVID-19 and holistic measure to support innovation is needed. Uh, targeted financial incentive to develop and deepen uh, their technological capabilities of firm underpinning uh, several types of innovation, a new product, new process, new business model are needed. Uh, Non-financial incentive like government subsidy training program also necessary. Digital infrastructure like 5G telecommunication network uh, need to be enhanced and consultancy and uh, guidance service uh, to business uh, from the government agency or university is quite needed. Uh, also, uh, can do see regulation, market creation measures like the government procurement for innovative uh, products and service are quite necessary. And uh, uh, on the market the demand uh, policy, uh, Southeast Asia is still lacking. Um, a lot of policy focusing more on the supply side. And uh, industry-specific policy measures for both tradition and uh, emerging industry are ne necessary. So not only uh, generic economy-wide policy, uh, many industries need uh, specific uh, policy measures because innovation process in uh, different industries are different from each other. So I want to end my talk here and thank you very much for uh, your uh, uh, or inviting me and share, sharing my my idea. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Thank you very much, P Professor Patara Pong of National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies. He presented on Southeast Asia's policy measures to respond to COVID-19 <coughs> with innovation. Now we will begin our fifth presentation. We have the presenter, Dr. Mikuria Hal Teklamariam, the CEO of Policies Institute of Ethiopia, who will uh, present on developing ICT policy to enable the fight against COVID-19 in Africa, initiating collaboration based on South Korea's best practices. Present on a research, developing ICT policies that enables to fight COVID-19 in Africa, initiating collaboration project based on South Korea's best practices. In this uh, presentation, I am going to address the background at global and Africa level of COVID-19, literature review papers published on this uh, topic, the research objectives, debates, methodology, hypothesis, and methods. I am going to, I am also going to present the findings of the paper, the arguments why I uh, choose Korea as uh, a benchmarking country and unique contribution of uh, the study and finally uh, conclusion of the paper. In the background, as global level COVID-19 uh, uh, confirmed cases are mostly correlated with highly urbanized and developed countries, countries which have high urbanization and developed economies, they are uh, encountering high uh, rate of confirmed cases and also uh, confirmed uh, diseases. If we see as an example, the US uh, uh, case, more than 8 million people already infected by the virus and more than 222 thousand days. In Brazil, more than 5 million, and days more than 150,000. Uh, in India, more than um, 7 uh, million infected uh, cases and more than 110,000 days. When we see the, uh, the days and uh, the confirmed cases, uh, highly uh, urbanized countries are uh, encountering high infection rate. When we see the uh, cumulative cases in Africa and diseases and percentage of 
this is from uh, total confirmed cases. Uh, in Africa, the phenomena uh, works uh, similar to the global cases. In Africa, uh, South Africa, Morocco, Egypt, these countries are highly urbanized and their income level is relative to other African countries, they are middle income countries. Countries which are less urbanized, less uh, level of economic development, the infection rate is also uh, less. Taking this uh, background, the Africa is trying to fight COVID-19 by enabling ICT. For this purpose, I referred a thorough research made by European Investment Bank uh, concerning African digital solution to tackle COVID-19. Even though it is very fragmented, there are ICT-related initiatives to fight COVID-19, like a telephone-based application for uh, contact tracing in Kenya, drones uh, spreading messages in rural area in Ivory Coast, and delivering samples to medical laboratories in Ghana and Rwanda using drones, and uh, software applications for, for self-diagnosis in uh, 15 African countries, uh, such as in Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, Uganda. Uh, there are a good initiatives, and also in Tanzania, e-learning and social uh, media uh, usage for information uh, distribution and uh, for monitoring the food and non-food uh, logistics using uh, platforms. So uh, based on this uh, uh, practical uh, initiatives in Africa uh, and at global levels, there are a lot of uh, literatures published uh, empirical uh, based on theoretical concepts. For this research purpose, I made uh, a thorough uh, analysis and evaluation of uh, this literature. And there is a framework developed by Davson in 2019 uh, about uh, eHealth uh, platform and the frameworks. But this research is uh, directly related to uh, COVID-19 and I uh, referred only ICT ecosystem to which helps COVID-19 uh, to take a policy pillars based on uh, ICT. Uh, the literatures which I referred are taking pillars as uh, e-health, uh, interoperable e-government system, uh, private and public online services, uh, digital skill and uh, sustainable uh, infrastructure and digital transformation, and also uh, the uh, case of urbanization and densification role for COVID-19 uh, uh, spread. So I, I made a thorough analysis and uh, said, uh, analyzed the literature gap and set research objective. The literature gap is that in this, uh, a lot of, a number of publications, there are no any empirical evidence based on data analysis, which have a critical impact in controlling COVID-19. For this purpose, I uh, considered Africa as a continent, uh, 54 countries, and I got uh, uh, empirical, well-organized uh, data for 46 countries, which is 85% of the African countries, 54 African countries, and I run pooled and interaction effect model analysis, uh, to identify uh, significant factors which have uh, impact in controlling uh, COVID-19. So the contribution of, the unique contribution of this paper is uh, proposing uh, policy uh, directions and policy proposals for African countries based on empirical evidence for the purpose uh, uh, the, uh, I identified uh, objectives to describe the African context and uh, the proposed ICT policies which have 
practical impact on controlling COVID and contribution for sustainable uh, uh, economic development. So uh, beside that, I took South Korea as a benchmark uh, for this study purpose uh, because there are a lot of um, best practices which is published by the Korean government uh, and also the many stakeholders participated in this uh, uh, report preparation. And there is also favorable condition because of readiness from the Korean side. Uh, I took Korea as a benchmark. Why Korea? Because Korea uh, flattened the curve within short period of time, within 20 days. And Korea also used ICT as a, a tool to fight uh, uh, the spread of uh, coronavirus. And also Korea produced uh, how uh, 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 Korea flattened the curve within short period of time and the role of ICT well identified and well organized. So uh, the lessons which we can learn from uh, Korea is that ICT can have a significant contribution to uh, uh, control COVID-19 and also for uh, sustainable health service delivery. And uh, from Korea, we can learn that ICT shouldn't be a short-term uh, intervention. It should be strategic and long-term. And beside that, there is well-organized uh, report and readiness from the Korean side. That's why we are arguing that Korea could be a best practice. So uh, we prepared not only the theoretical and uh, conceptual uh, proposal and recommendation for African countries. We also try to substantiate by empirical evidence and we developed a hypothesis taking uh, COVID-19 cases relative to urban population as dependent variable urbanization, e-government, online service, telecom infrastructure, universal health coverage, uh, force industrial, uh, force uh, uh, generation network coverage, electricity, female social media penetration, female schooling, application on local uh, language, server security, and tertiary education as a skill. I uh, developed a hypothesis and uh, expected sign also uh, developed uh, to control uh, COVID-19 and which are enabling COVID to be uh, uh, spread with fast uh, uh, rate. I also developed uh, a model, uh, the measurements of these uh, independent variables and abbreviations of uh, the model. So the main critical point uh, in this research is uh, I correlated uh, COVID-19 cases uh, relative to urban, urbanization. And I uh, depicted here how the urbanization is very high. Uh, the COVID is becoming very high, which is expressed in the case of uh, Cape Verde and South Africa. And uh, the country which we took as a best practice, which is Korea, highly developed, highly uh, urbanized, but low rate of COVID-19, uh, which is very special relative to other uh, countries, which is the best uh, uh, performance relative to the whole African countries. And that's why I took as a benchmark. The research model uh, which I developed is, how is the impact of COVID-19 relative to urban countries and ICT indicators as dependent variable and also interaction model, especially the telecom infrastructure and online service, when they are uh, supplied concurrently, how is the impact on COVID-19 uh, well addressed in this uh, research? So the, I also checked the robustness of the model. Uh, I used R. 3.4.3 uh, for regression analysis and uh, checked whether the hypothesis uh, I uh, developed is congruent with the research finding and the result is also presented. Uh, before running the regression, we checked the pair-wise correlation and VIF 
based on this one uh, both uh, evaluation uh, only e government is a bit highly correlated uh, with other dependent in, independent variables which is more than uh, 10 point uh, 10 which is 10.86 uh, when we see VIF otherwise the, the there is no serious uh, correlation problem and uh, the model is robust. The findings show that there are uh, uh, findings which is against uh, my hypothesis, which is online and universal uh, health coverage. Maybe these two independent variables are highly correlated with urbanization, and that might be the case which needs thorough, deep uh, investigation. Uh, these two are the only uh, hypothesis uh, the, the finding, which is against the hypothesis. The others, urbanization, e-government, uh, 4G uh, network, uh, gender, uh, social media penetration gap, uh, gender schooling gap, uh, cyber security, tertiary education, and interaction between online service and telecommunication infrastructure have uh, uh, a finding, as I hypothesized. The interaction the uh, telecom telecommunication infrastructure uh, supply and online ser service Wh when they are uh, concurrently available they have uh, a good uh, tool to fight telecommunication uh, uh, covid-19 uh, control so the discussion the finding is that as i said uh, online service e-government, telecommunication infrastructure with a good planetable policy framework have a, a good uh, contribution for uh, controlling, controlling COVID. So uh, e-health service, digital uh, improvement, uh, affirmative action with female for schooling and uh, media penetration, e-government service, secured server and uh, digital skill are very critical to use ICT fighting uh, COVID-19. Uh, Having this empirical evidence as a research, we are proposing collaboration uh, with uh, uh, South Korea uh, because uh, South Korea have a sustainable long-term uh, achievement on ICT, which uh, has shown a good contribution to control uh, COVID-19 and flattening in 20 days time and uh, to have this multifaceted uh, challenge, uh, uh, African countries should initiate a win-win uh, scenario project with detailed visibility study and uh, engaging uh, stakeholders uh, taking um, as the Korea uh, uh, best performing country. So as a conclusion, I am proposing uh, South Korea to be, uh, should be taken as a benchmark uh, to scale up the best practice of uh, South Korea to the whole African countries taking uh, African uh, member states uh, with the umbrella of uh, African uh, Union. And uh, to initiate uh, this project there should be a visibility study and international community should support this uh, 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 initiative as a project which is going to have not only to control the pandemic but also uh, con uh, control uh, sustainable contribute for sustainable uh, development goals and the help of international community is very important more than any time before. And contextual African countries should contextualize uh, this uh, best practice. And if uh, uh, there is going to be a collaboration uh, initiative, the empirical evidence uh, shown very well uh, as I presented in this research. So thank you uh, very much uh, for the listening. I think the research is a sorrow. The report uh, may be uh, distributed to the whole participant uh, through STEPI. This is only a brief uh, uh, 
concept and findings of my paper. Thank you uh, very much for the listening. Uh, uh, hope we'll meet again in another session. Thank you very much. Ethiopia Chongtek Yonguo. We had the presentation from Dr. Mikuria Hal Teklemanam from uh, Policy Institute of Ethiopia. He talked about why Korea is a benchmark country and how Korea can work with African countries. I would now like to introduce our sec sixth presentation. We will be hearing from Dr. Il Yong Chong, Research Fellow at STEPI, and uh, Dr. Chong will be speaking on the future of Korea's digital bio industry. The title of the presentation is The Future of Korean Digital Healthcare Industry Challenges and Potentials. It is a pleasure to meet you. I am from Steppi Il Yong Chong. First of all, I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to present at such an important gathering. Today, I'm going to talk about the future of Korean digital healthcare industry challenges and potentials, in particular, uh, the future uh, vision of healthcare amidst COVID 19. And then I'm going to go on to trends in the digital healthcare challenges in South Korea, potentials for South Korea. I think uh, that uh, healthcare is a very broad concept. It is uh, disease treatment, health management, uh, and in this area, various de devices are being used. And I think uh, that data is the main infrastructure for digital healthcare. Uh, there is uh, healthcare data from electronic medical records and personal health uh, records and uh, genetic analysis information. And also, there is also national health information from public agencies such as the Korea Health Insurance and uh, also uh, HERA. And uh, the digital healthcare industry is expanding. In the past, we just talked about mobile health and uh, precise uh, um, health care and uh, wearables. But uh, these days, we are talking about digital therapeutics and uh, telehealth. In Korea, this year, uh, STEPI conducted uh, health care as a like, future vision technology and uh, therefore we looked at uh, the vision of healthcare uh, post to covid-19 so what will be the future of our world and uh, we wanted to view covid-19 as a, a opportunity for innovation and we need to think about uh, what our future will be first of all we worked with experts in korea and we carried out uh, a uh, workshop uh, to assess what will happen in 5 years and 10 years and uh, we identify 14 events uh, of the future, and uh, we uh, thought about what types uh, of futures would uh, be acceptable. So these are the future events in the healthcare industry, real-time healthcare management, and uh, uh, so there will be damages of data leakage, and uh, through uh, to due to uh, telehealth, there was uh, some events that the people thought of medical and minimalism and uh, that uh, health care will reduce. And uh, uh, due to COVID-19, we uh, talked about uh, the new insurances, so national new insurance coverage for infectious diseases. And uh, so we carried out a survey with uh, 1,000 people in Korea and 1,000 people overseas. And uh, there was a uh, high uh, preference for real-time health care management and it's also very feasible and so the domestic survey results showed that there was a preference to close the gap in the health sector and the reason why we carried out this survey with overseas person was because we felt that this there are global like health issues and about most of the um, surveyees were from India and USA, and uh, we saw from the overseas survey result that a preference for uh, enforcement of the National Infectious Disease Protection System. Up until last year, uh, managing 
healthcare with real-time data. There was a controversy because of the privacy issue, so it was a difficult issue. But to, due to COVID-19 on the digital healthcare, uh, we see that there will be a lot of acceptance, and so that is one of the expectations that we have on the digital healthcare. Uh, by 2020, so this uh, was the year that we received the most, this industry received the most amount of funding. The biggest investment was made in 2020 uh, since the past 10 years. So many industries are undergoing seismic uh, changes and there have been negative impacts. But for the digital healthcare, it is leading to a breakthrough because of COVID-19. The first one is telemedicine and WHO defined that the delivery of healthcare services when and distance is a critical factor uh, from the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of disease and injuries. Uh, that was the broad definition by WHO. And the reason why I'm showing you this picture is because when we think of uh, telemedicine, we only think about uh, teleconsultation. But there are many other areas, such as telemonitoring, nursing, and diagnosis, uh, education, administration. And it's not just uh, phone calls, emails, check text messages, and you can even use uh, chatbots. In 2020, August, the largest telemedicine company, which is Teladoc, uh, merged with Live on Go at a price of 18.5 billion. Teladoc was one of the largest beneficiaries of COVID-19. Uh, there was a uh, gap in the medical service that could be pr provided, and uh, untac service was provided, and uh, there was a explosive growth, therefore, for teledoc. And in the case of the United States, and most of the medical uh, staff had to focus on uh, dealing with the COVID-19 patients. And so there was a gap in the health care service that you could receive for those undergoing chronic uh, diseases and uh, minor diseases. And uh, so there was this big event this year of these two companies, uh, Live on Go and uh, Teladoc merging. And, uh, and if you look at artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning, there was development uh, pre-COVID-19. In particular, uh, radiology and cardiology were areas in which uh, FDA approval was received. And another hot area is the digital therapeutics. <clears throat> Up until now, uh, other than de, um, like receiving uh, injections or um, medication, that was most of the therapeutics. But now there's also digital therapeutics. This is child undergoing ADHD uh, can receive treatment uh, by playing this game. So it's a software. And in 2020, first half in the US, uh, there are many products uh, that are receiving FDA approval for such uh, uh, products. And uh, D2C genetic testing, uh, this shows the 2019 data. In early 2019, it was uh, more than 6.3 million and 23 and me as 12 million were their um, users and 80 percent of them said that uh, they agree to 23 and me utilizing their genetic data for research so now they they have a 10 million uh, amount of data that they can uh, use and do you see that Black Friday, uh, you can receive uh, such discounts uh, to get to uh, genetic testing. And I think uh, the business model can be divided into three, uh, providing genetic tests and utilizing the data. It can be used for new drug development and uh, therapeutics. And a good example will be GSK in 2018. Uh, they have a four-year exclusive data usage, and they uh, invested $300 million into 23andMe. And, uh, 23andMe developed a new medicine, and they exported their technology to Almira. And this is a very uh, hot industry that's developing these days. And uh, another example is uh, medication delivery. The reason why I'm showing you this is because uh, for telemedication, you need to have a medication delivery. Uh, let's say you had a remote consultation, and if you will have to go to a pharmacy that is near that hospital, it is not possible. So it needs to go together with the medication delivery. And PillPack was a US startup. 
and uh, our parents. Uh, Generation, they take uh, not just one pill, but they have to take several. And in some cases, they need to uh, be administered with one pill per day, others three. Therefore, it's quite complicated, and it's not easy to, to comply with the, the administration to, uh, rules. And uh, so the medication is sorted, and uh, information about this is combined, and uh, it is being delivered to the um, <clears throat> Consumers, which leads to better compliance to the administration schedule of the drugs. And a pill pack was acquired in 2018 by Amazon. Then let's look at the situation here in Korea. Korea has a very sophisticated ICT infrastructure, and we have a lot of smartphones. So overseas, they have high expectations for telemedicine in Korea. And we are receiving requests about the level of telemedicine here in South Korea. But to, to explain about Korea's digital health care, we have a high level of regulation, and that is why many companies are struggling in this area. Uh, just on telemedicine from 2002 up to, until 2019, uh, many laws have been raised and they were discarded in 2019, 2020 due to the spread of COVID-19. We are providing telemedicine, uh, at, and it was temporary rarely allowed. You might think that this is a great development, but although we discussed this for the past 10 years, we realized that we were not well we were not well prepared. As a researcher, I uh, realized this. <clears throat> and uh, there is a very limited uh, narrow interpretation of article 34 of the medical law there Therefore, this Article 34 needs to be revised. And uh, I told you that uh, AI and machine learning devices have received FDA approval in the United States. And uh, likewise, in Korea, there were 53 devices uh, that were approved by Korea uh, FDA. But uh, these devices, they were just approved. They were not put into to the, um, like one of the items in which will be covered by the national insurance. So it has to be connected with that. And uh, for the uh, D2C genetic testing is under regulatory sandbox. Therefore, temporarily, there were deregulation, and uh, that's why it's being provided. There are a couple of companies that provide this service. However, the consumers uh, don't feel that the level of service provided is sufficient enough to make that purchase, and that's why it's not growing. For digital therapeutics, this it's in the initial phase, and uh, the KFDA released digital therapeutic approval and review guidelines in August of 2020. Uh, so we now have these guidelines. And on the medication delivery, uh, it has to be discussed with uh, the telemedicine at the, now, at the point now, but it's not uh, discussed yet, and it is still illegal. Uh, I carried out a survey on the regulations that need to be improved for new drugs and new medical devices in Korea. Uh, so the highest uh, and uh, the highest respondents, the biggest number of respondents uh, said that there has to be some expertise in regulatory examinations. You and uh, I I'm a researcher uh, dealing with the medical data, and when I received this theme to uh, speak on this item, uh, although I Although I'm not a specialist in this area, I decided to give a presentation on this because I wanted to, to uh, provide my praise to the struggling companies in this area for monitoring, of uh, telemonitoring, it was a bit ambiguous according to the regulations whether it uh, was approvable or not. Uh, and uh, in the beginning of this year, the Ministry of Health and Welfare, uh, they said uh, that uh, telemonitoring is possible. And uh, so it seems that it will be possible going into the future. And uh, for uh, telemedicine, it uh, was um, allowed for a certain period, and uh, Medi here uh, announced uh, their product uh, to speak to a Korean uh, doctor. 
And there are many other companies involved in telemedicine. And these companies have a global level of technology. Not only this, but they are working with hospitals. They're working very closely in order to verify the usability and if there is any additional demand in the hospitals, they are identifying that. Therefore, I believe that this industry has rosy prospects in the future. And on digital therapeutics, None have been approved yet. However, Life Semantics, they have Red Pill Care. And there's also another company, Welt, that this is a fall prevention smart belt. And about 10 companies will be uh, launching a digital um, therapeutic related approval documents. They will submit this to receive approval. And in Korea, the DTC genetic testing, it's very limited in what you can receive. But uh, 3 billion, uh, they can uh, provide uh, testing for 7,000 rare diseases, rare genetic diseases. And it's a service that is being exported globally, and a human space is a company that provides personal health records via blockchain. And for my information, if there is a uh, there is there a pharmaceutical company that needs such data, then they can purchase it, and I will be receiving tokens in return. So Korean companies are working hard in this area. And uh, the government is also carrying out a bio big data project to, uh, to support the development of new drugs and medical device products and the digital healthcare industry by analyzing numerous data. And uh, digital uh, healthcare, it grew explosively, and uh, the categories are really expanding quickly. It's not just about the devices, uh, therapeutics, and medication, so the areas are expanding. And in digital health care, what you need to understand is uh, the uh, usability of the products and services. Uh, wearable devices, even if you start using it, um, if it's not comfortable, you won't use it, and uh, the software games too. Um, it has to be usable and uh, you may think that this technology will lead to good products and services. If you start from the technology, it will lead to failure. Therefore, you need to uh, flip it around, develop your products from starting from the consumer's pain points. And on the regulations, the technology is developing so quickly, therefore the regulations will need to be flexible and uh, there has to be regulatory harmony. Also, it has to be included in the structure of medical cost in the medical insurance system. I think that uh, ICT uh, skills and uh, um, also the healthcare industry need to work together uh, to lead to innovative digital health care. And for this to lead to tangible results, we need regulation and institutional support. Um, if uh, such regulation and institution support is not provided, then the Korean startups will uh, not start their business in Korea. They will go overseas, which will mean that Korean consumers will not enjoy the benefits of uh, the digital health care. And another unfortunate thing is that many digital healthcare startups, they are not targeting Korea. They are already targeting the U.S. market first. And as a policy um, researcher, when we look at digital healthcare, we would like to see a more active review of the regulations in this industry. And with this, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. We heard from Dr. Il Young Chung, research fellow at Step B. She talked about Korea's digital healthcare industry's potentials, and she talked about the importance of strengthening regulations appropriate for the development of digital healthcare. Then we will go on to the last presentation of today's symposium. Our last presenter is uh, head of the Office of Institutional Innovation Research at STEPI, Lee myung -hwa, who will present on South Korea's policy response to COVID-19. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. 
I am head of the Office of Institutional Innovation Research at STEPI, Yi Myung-hwa. Today, I would like to present to you on how South Korea is responding to COVID-19 through policies. These are the topics I'll cover today. There are four main topics. Number one, I will give you a background on the situation of COVID-19 in Korea and outside of Korea, and also our immediate responses to COVID-19. Then I will share with you our recovery plan for the post-COVID-19 era. And last but not least, I will uh, talk about the lessons from COVID-19 as well as policy implications. As you know well, at the global level, this is what COVID-19 looks like. Uh, as you can see, uh, we continue to see new infections. As you can see in the graph, in North America and in Europe, we continue to see an increase in confirmed cases. And we thought that Korea flattened the curve, but yesterday we had 500 uh, confirmed cases. And today there was a news report that we've had uh, more than 600 daily confirmed cases. So many people worry about the third wave of the pandemic in Korea. Because of COVID-19, we have had a lot of adjustments in our economic outlook as well. Uh, at the end of last year, OECD gave this projection for the economic growth. You can see pathway A here. Due to COVID-19, the outlook for economic growth has not been met. And uh, pathway B or C is what we are seeing at the moment. We have had a lot of losses in terms of the economy. and. Uh, we still see a lot of difficulties in the future outlook for economic recovery. In terms of the Korean economic outlook, which was announced in August, when there is a single shock and when there are two shocks, GDP could take different paths. And you can see that in both scenarios, we can expect a minus growth. A few days ago, OECD uh, announced the outlook for the economic growth, and uh, Korea was projected to record minus 1.2% growth. And now I would like to talk about the government response to COVID-19. And this is a slide that I can introduce to you with a sense of pride. Uh, so this is basically Korea's crisis response system. We went through SARS and also MERS, uh, situations. So we already were equipped with a crisis response system in the face of COVID-19. We have the uh, Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasure Headquarters, which is headed by the Prime Minister. And then we also have the Central Disaster Management Headquarters headed by the Ministry of Health of Welfare and Central Disease Control Headquarters headed by the director of KCDC. So we already had this crisis response system in place, which allowed us to respond better to COVID-19. Furthermore, we have had uh, fast track amendments of several laws. Number one, we had the amendment in the Infectious Disease Control and Prevention Act. This act was amended very swiftly in order to allow swift hospitalization, diagnosis, and treatment. Those who reject hospitalization and treatment can be punished under the amended law. Also, the Quarantine Act was amended so that we were able to ban the entry of foreign nationals arriving from at-risk countries or regions. Also, the Medical Service Act was amended, and this laid the legal ground for monitoring of infectious diseases. Uh, this was our swift response after COVID-19 broke out. And also, in terms of uh, contact tracing, personal information like the gender, uh, name, location, etc., are no longer disclosed because there was some uh, controversy regarding the privacy of uh, contact tracing. So that was another amendment to the law that we made. And these are some of the key R&D activities in Korea in relations to COVID-19. As you can see, we have uh, KNIH under KCDC, and we have Korea Health Industry Development Institute, Institute Pasteur Korea, Korea Institute of Chemical Technology, and KRIBB. These are the public institutions that are doing research and development to develop uh, test kits, treatments, vaccines, 
and also they are working to uh, secure the right infrastructure. Also, there are private companies engaged in R&D activities, and you can see the details in this table. We have the we have uh, we've had a big growth of the diagnostics companies, and that is why we were able to secure the diagnostics kits very quickly. And this is all thanks to these companies that worked hard. And next, um, as you know, uh, there is the word K-Quarantine, which demonstrates the excellent uh, infection prevention measures of Korea. And this has uh, drawn attention from across the world. And one of them was our Epidemiological Investigation Support System, or EISS. We can very swiftly trace the movements of the infected people. And uh, this is based on our smart city technology. We can track uh, people using credit card information or GPS. All of this information is integrated in order to quickly carry out epidemiological investigation. And also, we can actually uh, distinguish the close contacts so that we can trace their movements. Also, we have an application to trace the movements of confirmed cases so that we can ensure that they isolate themselves. We have an application for self-isolation as well to make sure that they stay at home. And now I would like to introduce to you about how we hope to recover from COVID-19, how we are preparing for the days beyond uh, the pandemic. pandemic. One core initiative of the Korean government is the so-called Korean New Deal, which was announced in July by the president himself. Uh, this is about uh, turning COVID-19 into an opportunity, turning the crisis into an opportunity so that we can completely transform the social system. The basic pillar is the digital New Deal and the Green New Deal. And also you have another pillar characterized by strengthening of the safety net. If you look at the digital New Deal, uh, uh, it involves stronger integration of DNA throughout the economy so that we can actually build a digital ecosystem throughout our society and ecosystem. And also the digital New Deal involves digitizing educational infrastructure, fostering the contactless industry and digitization of social overhead capital. Another important pillar of the Korean New Deal is Green New Deal. This is about turning the overall urban infrastructure green and also achieving low carbon as well as decentralized energy policy. Also, it includes the uh, green industry and innovation in the green industry. Below that, you see stronger safety net. Um, one of them could be resolving the unemployment issues. Korean New Deal is really a uh, a broad policy that requires uh, a lot of budget. So the budget is about 16 billion, 16 billion won. And sorry, 160 trillion won is the budget dedicated to the Korean New Deal. So it really involves a lot of investments in order to uh, carry out uh, Green Deal, Digital New Deal, and reinforce the safety net to create more jobs as well. One of the most impress impressive points of the Korean New Deal is the organizational structure. Until now, the initiatives led by the governments were either led by an individual government agency or it was led at a pan-governmental level. In the case of Korean New Deal, since it involves such a grand vision and broad vision, it involves not just the government agencies, but also the National Assembly and the legislation. As you can see, there is a strategy meeting on the Korean New Deal, which is at the very top. This is chaired by the president. And then you have the joint uh, committee between the government and the Democratic Party. And uh, the co-chairs are Deputy Prime Minister of Economy and uh, the chief of the Korea New Deal committee. From the government side, the Ministry of Economy is involved 
in order to identify and define the roles of all the other government agencies. Also, the Ministry of Economy is in charge of monitoring and coordinating the different government agencies. And from the party side, you have the, the chief of the Korean New Deal Committee heading this joint committee. So this is the governance for the Korean New Deal, and this is necessary because the Korean New Deal is not just one of the many initiatives, but uh, the New Deal is really a grand vision that will um, create and shape the future of Korea. And that is why the government, the, the as well as the National Assembly, which is the legislative body, have to be involved. Next, I would like to talk about what kind of science and technology policies we have in Korea. Last August, during the ministerial meeting, post-corona science and technology policy direction was announced. There are five main policy plans. Number one is to have private sector driven R&D model. And number two is to foster digital transformation. Number three is to foster human resources. And number four is to have a science and technology based crisis response system. And number five is about science and technology diplomacy. Uh, these are some of the promising technologies identified by Korea. There are mainly eight areas ranging from healthcare, manufacturing, education, data protection, and so forth. There are about 30 different uh, promising technologies under these eight domains, and these eight uh, these uh, promising technologies will be the focus of uh, government support in the future. Next. Uh, after COVID-19, we have been reminded of the importance of international cooperation. And uh, I always stress the importance of international cooperation. Today at this symposium, I would like to share with you how we are cooperating internationally uh, with the less developed countries and the developing countries. Uh, this is related to ICT cooperation. In 48 countries, we have these projects to overcome digital disparity or digital gap. We have ISE or Information Access Center project. There are IACs uh, established in developing countries in order to aid digitization in these countries, as well as to foster human resources in ICT. This is the cooperation between Korea and Paraguay. This is an ICT project between the two countries. Here you see how 3D printers are used to produce facial masks. A Paraguayan university in Korea are working together. They worked together to accomplish this together. So we can respond to the crisis using ICT. And also we have a recovery plan so that we can um, survive in the post-COVID era. Now let me tell you some of our implications and lessons from COVID-19. What we learned, first of all, is the important role of science and technology. When I do a lot of when I do research on policies related to uh, COVID-19, one of the questions that get asked the most often is, what role did science and technology play? In response to COVID-19, of course, healthcare professionals worked very hard. And at the same time, what role, what contribution did science and technology make? That's a question that I, that I get often. And I often answer like this. One of the key characteristics of COVID-19 is that it's uncertain. There are so many things we don't know about the virus, which means it's very difficult to define which direction we should move in responding to COVID-19. And that was really the core um, characteristic of COVID-19 pandemic. Science and technology allows us to understand the virus better, and I think that was the major contribution of science and technology. When we first started having confirmed cases, we uh, were able to uh, have the genetic information of the virus, and 
There are so many different subclasses of the coronavirus, and these different classes have different characteristics in terms of the contagion. And therefore, uh, securing scientific evidence for these different um, classes of virus was very important. Also, in contact tracing, ICT played a very important role because we had um, ICT-based tra uh, contact tracing, which was very swift, and that helped us to uh, address the pandemic. And also diagnostics kits, of course, were very important. The, governor, the government continued to invest in the uh, development of diagnostics kit, and private companies used AI to produce these kits very quickly. And that is why Korea was able to diagnose big numbers of people and test big numbers of people. Also, uh, in terms of vaccines or therapy development, uh, we may be a little behind other countries at the moment. However, science and technology did play an important role there. And that is why investment in R&D is very important. If you look at the US or other developed countries, Korea is still not investing as much in R&D of um, infectious diseases. Therefore, uh, our lesson from COVID-19 is that we should step up the investment in this field. Next, uh, we learned a lot about resilience. This was a completely unexpected crisis. How can we effectively and quickly respond to such a crisis? This is all up to the resilience of the systems in place. We, ca we um, came out of SARS and, and MERS, and so we know how important diagnostics kits were. That was the lesson we learned during the two earlier pandemics, and that is why the government was able to respond very quickly during COVID-19. And so I would like to stress uh, resilience, and especially emergency approval scheme was uh, uh, very useful and effective during the COVID-19 pandemic. This involves the government granting quick approval uh, for the diagnostics development companies. And the government promised that any company that developed good diagnostics kits could would be approved on a fast track scheme. And that was one of the reasons why we were able to respond so quickly to COVID-19. Also, we've had the drive through test centers, which is something that nobody has thought of before. These were the things that were quickly approved and applied on the field. And this was um, what contributed to the high resilience of Korea to COVID-19. This is my last slide. In the international community, one of the most debated topic is transformation. Through COVID-19, we learned that we're at a turning point. Um, we lived in the pre-COVID era. Now we have to live in the post-COVID era. So how can we actually make our life more sustainable, more inclusive, more resilient? We have to answer that question. And we have to really take a transformative approach to our policies as well at this turning point. The theme of today's uh, symposium is also innovating STI policy, which means that we have to move away from the conventional ways. We have to move toward uh, new ways. To do that, we have to have cross-sectoral and cross-agency and cross-domain cooperation. Uh, so people talk about the whole, the whole of government. You need to create collaboration systems across different stakeholders. Also, we have to define our direction for the policy, which is indicated in the Korean New Deal. Now we have to focus more on resolving social issues. With that, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Dr. Lee myung -hwa for your presentation. She talked about how South Korea responded to COVID-19 using ICT policies and science and technology policies, as well as future implications. So we are holding the Steppy 
International Symposium 2020 Innovate STI Policy, STI Responding to COVID-19 Era and Digital Transformation. We will now hear from Dr. Chil U Sung, Vice President of STEPI, to provide a wrap-up and closing. Hello, everyone. I am Vice President Sung Chi U from Steppi. Before I wrap up, I would like to first state my thanks to the experts from home and abroad who have provided their presentations via online and offline. And on behalf of Steppi, I would like to thank you very much. While listening to the presentations, uh, there was a lot of uh, insightful, impressive, and interesting content. In wrapping up uh, the International Com Symposium, instead of uh, mentioning the individual experts, I would rather like to talk about the content that was discussed. And uh, we heard about the science, technology, and innovation policies amidst the crisis. Uh, as we heard from the presentations, the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic actually stretched the institutions and systems of countries to uh, its almost limits. And that is why the countries and organizations had to cooperate and work with one another to provide concerted efforts and to combine our investments and efforts. We have global issues such as climate crisis and sustainability. And I think that COVID-19, this issue led to true uh, unity among organizations, governments, and uh, the private and public sector and so forth. So I think it's unprecedented that uh, the COVID-19 brought us all together on this issue into a united front. And because of this, so we need new STI response. We need a resetting. And uh, what was very impressive out of the presentations was uh, about uh, global acting and the re need for global cooperation. And I think uh, that uh, there will have to be global cooperation from uh, country level, organization level, and individual researchers even. And uh, we heard about the efforts of Europe, uh, and uh, Gaia X was explained. And uh, Europe's ICT digital infrastructure will be renewed, it will be restructured, and will be expanded. And these efforts have continued. However, due to COVID-19, uh, the scope has widened and the speed has accelerated. We also heard about uh, uh, ASEAN's, Southeast Asia's COVID-19 um, responses and the need for more longer term policies and ICT infrastructure and development and the need for manpower development was stated. And we saw that African countries are also putting in various efforts. And we heard about drones and mobile phone based um, activities and online platform education and uh, food being distributed uh, through various uh, new measures. And uh, the, these examples were all very insightful. And I think this was uh, mentioned. Uh, we in Korea have various experiences and we have our strengths. And I think that our experiences and strengths can be uh, applied into Southeast Asia, Eurasia, and Europe. And I think it can become a good theme for cooperation. As I said in the beginning, we need to act globally in global cooperation. Um, the themes will be healthcare, digitalization, 
uh, and uh, secure health security, so it'll expand. And uh, the STI cooperation and development cooperation that uh, Korea has been uh, involved in in the past uh, will expand even further, including more topics and more themes as we uh, go into the future. Therefore, Step B uh, will have to be involved in more multilateral cooperation and uh, participate in uh, additional ODA programs. We already um, have uh, many programs that we are involved in, but uh, we will have to include uh, more themes into our activities and expand the scope and uh, the spread of what we are doing. And uh, as I wrap up, what I would like to mention is that uh, while listening to the presentations, uh, two uh, key words uh, uh, were very impressive, which was macro innovation and uh, high tech entrepreneurialism. So these two words really stood out. And uh, Professor Horwich uh, um, compared the two. And I think that these will go together in the future. They will be balanced. And uh, we saw the renovation of New York City. Uh, and uh, while listening to the presentations, and uh, um, what I would like to see is uh, in the United States, I think uh, one of the uh, cities that were impacted the most due to COVID-19 was will be New York, Manhattan. And uh, New York, Manhattan uh, will, I think, maybe transform itself into a smart city in the United States uh, due to uh, COVID-19. And uh, New York is the most attractive city in the world. And uh, it, uh, the COVID-19 might lead New York to become the most uh, uh, technology advanced uh, city. And uh, so those were some thoughts that came to my mind. And uh, one uh, last question that I would like to ask to all of those watching and the experts is as follows. Actually, viruses uh, that uh, uh, are spreading offline, it changed our lives and uh, the behaviors in our lives, and it's leading to an acceleration of digital transformation. And one thought that I had was, uh, let's say there's an online virus uh, like COVID-19 in the next 10 to, five, 10 to 5 years, then it might lead to a stop in online. And uh, then how will this impact our daily lives? Uh, how will it influence uh, the way we live? And uh, as uh, a policy institution, I would like to give you and propose to you a agenda item. Um, in the mid to long term, uh, we need to think about various policies uh, to plan for the mid to long term. But there are also uh, these unexpected variables that uh, we cannot uh, account for. And how should the government to respond to this? And how should we uh, make plans for this? So we need to, to have sustainability in our policies, but we need to be flexible to respond to the unprecedented variables, and I think we should be uh, able to uh, respond to both. And uh, with the, uh, this, I would like to extend my gratitude to all those who have uh, participated in De Steppi's International Symposium 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being with us again. And thank you very much for your summary of 2020 STEPI International Symposium, uh, Dr. Song Chi Ung, uh, Vice President of STEPI. With this, we conclude uh, the symposium. Once again, thank you very much to the speakers as well as our distinguished guests and participants. Also, I would, also, I would like to thank uh, those of you who are joining us online. I know this is a difficult time for all amidst COVID-19. I wish all of you a happy and warm year end. With this, we will conclude the symposium. Thank you.